So, today's stream, one of the things I get asked about a lot, hey wheels, is various AI stuff, which is not really a question you can answer, you know, how to do AI is so dependent on every single freaking program. Um, and sometimes it's as simple as doing an if statement. If blank, then blah, and that's it. Hey, Derava. Um, the problem comes up mostly when you have multiple AI behaviors. Any single AI behavior, hey, Viking Dance Instructor, any single AI behavior is basically just an if this, do that, else, do this. But when you have a lot of different AI behaviors that might have conflicting goals, then the question becomes kind of interesting. Hey, Thawing Owl, I will make a recommendation. If you are interested in AI, this is a fantastic book. Very great fun to read. Artificial Intelligence for Games by um, Ian Millington and John Funge over here. These two guys. That's the title. Really fun book to read. Um... And uh, I've had that thing for years, and it covers all kinds of different stuff. Hey, Yukofin. But one of the biggest questions really is about how do you organize these AI behaviors and how you get these different AI behaviors to work together. Hey, Nikon. So we're going to go and do that today, and we're going to do it in this game that, or rather, it's a simulation. It's not a game. We're not going to be interacting with it. It's going to operate entirely on its own. It's a game of gnomes, game of gnomes. And everyone knows that gnomes love Brussels sprouts. So in our game, gnomes, hey, Warland are going to get hungry. These are the little huff bars. If I hit play, I've already got a bunch of stuff implemented. If I hit play, you can see the green bar is going to start to shrink. That's their food energy. So he's getting hungry and hungry and hungry. And if he runs out of this, he'll start losing health at that point. So the gnomes are going to be looking for Brussels sprouts. But the other problem is that badgers, of course, love they eat gnomes as their primary food source. So this badger is going to be hunting the gnome. So the gnome is both going to be trying to get Brussels sprouts, so he doesn't starve to death, but also evade the badger. And then he can, oh, depending on time, we will, uh, we can potentially complicate it up a little bit, but what if we ha add some bushes that the gnome can hide in when he's being chased? Little ideas like that. And so already, but even by itself, if you're looking at the gnome, there's already two behaviors that may conflict. What happens if the Brussels sprouts are behind the badger. What does the gnome do? He wants to get to the Brussels sprouts, but he wants to avoid the badger. How do we work out these deals? What if there's multiple Brussels sprouts, multiple badgers? Um, what if there's multiple gnomes? Maybe gnomes like to stick together. And we could look at um, a flocking AI and that sort of thing. Now, we've only got about an hour for the programming, so we're gonna rush right into it at this point. Try to do the best. Um, so let me go and actually, just I'm just gonna put the uh, the Brussels sprouts over here. Actually, maybe I'll put them northwards because that'll be quite uh, good. Hey, Hedros. All right, let's dive right in. So I already have some scripts written added to these components. Um, you know, just a little script to, to do the health bars and energy bars, for example. But more importantly, I do have a pretty significant script for the critters. Everything in the game, including the Brussels sprouts, is a critter in here. And the critters do a couple of things. First of all, they make sure they're in the list of all critters by type. That's going to make it easy for um, the gnomes to find all vegetables, which is a Brussels sprout, or for the badgers to find all herbivores, which is what a gnome is, or for the gnomes to find all carnivores to avoid them. So the critters self-organize in this dictionary. That's what the start does here. Um, on this droid, we remove ourselves from the dictionary. And then the update that runs once per frame Critters lose a little bit of energy, they get a little bit hungry. If their energy is too low, they start losing health because they're starving. Um, if their health goes below zero, hey Rhino, if their health goes below zero, then they die. Right now we just destroy the game object. I've got a lot of comments in here for things you might want to add. This code will be available um, on uh, on my website, quillating.com, uh, quill the Unity tutorial section there. And this video should make it up on YouTube, although apparently the last time I did a programming stream, that, that didn't get on YouTube. So I'm going to go and find that and see if I can fix that. Um, so there's a lot of little to-dos that you could go and add things in later on to, you know, make it look cooler and also add more animal types. But here's the bulk of what we're going to be working on today. This script, this critter script, every frame will try to move in a direction. But by itself, it has no idea what direction to move into. So it's got this dir, you know, direction variable that we initially set to zero. And then down here, it tries to move in the direction, in that direction, multiplied by its current speed. So it's got a direction and it moves in that direction. How does it figure out what direction to actually move in? Well, what we are going to do is we have this desired directions list, 
we make it, we empty it and make it fresh every single frame. So desired direction, we get a new list over here. And then what we do is we call broadcast message. Broadcast message tells every script, every component attached to this game object. So again, let's talk about the gnome. So every script attached to the gnome will be told, hey, your do AI behavior function, run that function. And the do AI behavior functions is going to be responsible for feeding stuff into desired directions, which is a list of these weighted directions. We're going to take a look at this class here. This is one I just made. It's very simple. But this is going to add things to this list. Then what we're going to do is we're going to loop through this list of weighted directions after all our AI behaviors have run, and we'll use this to figure out what direction to actually move in. And that's it. That's, that's our, the entirety of our critters script over here. Now, what can an AI behavior do? Well, can literally do everything. It's everything that your critters are supposed to do in this game. Now, what this applies, whether you're making a 2D platformer, whether you're making a first person shooter with bots, any kind of game whatsoever can be implemented with this sort of design model over here. Um, and so these behaviors will include things for our gnome. Uh, I would like to look for food. Actually, look for food is just a behavior that both the gnome and the badger is going to have. They're just going to have slightly different targets. One is looking for vegetable. The other one is looking for herbivore to eat. Um, in addition, you could have something like avoid critter. So the gnome is going to be trying to avoid any critters in the carnivore group, for example. So those are predators. Actually, I guess I could have called them predators. That's fine. You guys, you guys have got it. It's okay. Um, so it's going to try to avoid anything in the carnivore group. So these are the examples of behaviors, but you can have more. Hide in the bush. Uh, maybe if you've got nothing to do, you could wander. Maybe, maybe one of the behaviors could be find something else of my species and try to procreate. You know, it depends on what kind of game you're making. It could be uh, maybe you have builder units, right? So um, if there's no enemies around, I'm going to go and, and hammer at this building, right? you got your Rim World, your Dwarf Fortress, all those sorts of things. Those behaviors can be like, well, I'm going to grab a new job from a production queue hit the mic, sorry about that. I'm gonna drive a new job from our production queue, go over there and work it. Um, oh, I've gotten hungry, so now another behavior is gonna take over and so on and so forth. So that's what we're gonna be working on here. Let's take a look at this weighted direction class. It's a very, very, very simple structure. Basically, it's just these things. It is a vector two that has a direction and it has a float, which is the weight. The weight is the importance of this particular direction. And we're gonna see how that factors into our um, decision making in just a moment. But the when we loop through everything every desired direction so after our do ai behavior script runs and we have a variety of desired directions we loop through each one and we add them up based on a combination of their direction multiplied by their weight so things with more weight will matter more in influencing this direction if you have one behavior that says go right at a weight of one and you have another behavior that says go left at a weight of two then the left direction is going to be considerably more influential so therefore you will be moving left and then um then what we do is we normalize it so no matter what the direction ends up being a, a vector of length one that we then multiply by the speed so even in that example we're not going to be moving left at two-thirds max speed we're going to be moving left at full speed because it's the one that won a better example is probably if we've got one guy who sort of wants to go up and one that sort of wants to go right in the end we'll sort of go a little bit diagonal and whether or not that is good or not will depend on what these various behaviors do so this weighted be direction class is basically just here to have direction and weight however i do have some extra comments about different things different parameters that you might want to use um, in your own thing for example different blending modes do they just blend with each other and, and you know add up and then average out or is one of them exclusive like one of our behaviors could be like listen i'm super important and i don't want to be blended with any other behavior if i'm in the list of, of weighted direction of desired direction this is the one you have to do and ignore the rest or you could have some that are flagged as maybe fallback or low priority directions which is but only consider me if there's literally nothing else in the list. For example, a sort of like wander behavior. If I've got nothing else to do, then maybe the gnome just sort of wanders around the map a little bit. Well, that sort of random wandering, I don't want to use that if there's anyone else doing anything. So I'm just flag it as fallback. We don't use this right now, but you could do it. The other thing you could do is you could put in a desired speed in here. We don't use this, but if you imagine that the... Um, right now, we lose energy. We lose sort of food energy every second. I think I've got it set to like lose five food energy per second right now. But, and moving doesn't actually use any extra energy, but it's very easy to imagine a situation where um, 
the faster you move, the energy co cost goes up sort of exponentially. So most of the time, you're going to still want to sort of move sort of here in the curve a little bit more optimally. But every now and again, like when you're being chased by a predator, you might want to boost yourself up to max speed, even though it's very energy inefficient. And so your AI behavior might want to return that information. But we're not doing that right now. We are only going to do direction and weight. So let's get one of these AI behaviors implemented. And all we have to do to have an AI behavior is it just has to be a script. It just has to be a component on the object that has a function called do AI behavior. So let's make our first one. Uh, where's my Unity window? Right over here. Let's make my first one. So we're going to go and I will make a C sharp script. I will call it, I don't know, AI seek food. Clear enough. Okay, we'll open that up. Now, this doesn't need an update function, almost certainly, because really every update, it's actually this that's going to be run. Um, I don't think it has to be public or anything like that. When you use, um, what you call it, broadcast message, I believe it will run protected functions. We're going to check that in a second, actually. I'll tell you what, I'll check it now. Debug.log. Um, do AI behavior. Actually, I'll go like that. So let's see if that shows up in our debug log that before we go forward. So we're going to add the script to our gnome. We're just going to add logic to our gnome right now. So it's going to have an AI behavior to seek food. So if I hit play, AI seek food. So that function is being run every single frame because we're calling it from here. Now, one of the things you can do is you can change it so it doesn't get run every frame. Maybe AI behavior only gets updated, I don't know, 10 times a second. So then you have you have a different sort of time thing. Maybe you use a coroutine. Maybe you just have a cooldown timer. Maybe you have it as a separate thread. You know, whatever. But you could have the AI um, behavior just run once or ten times a second, um, as opposed to literally every frame, because maybe the AI behavior takes a while to compute. Especially if you start introducing uh, pathfinding, right? A star pathfinding for different things. Well, you might not want that to literally go every single frame. So you spread it out a little bit, and that's okay. You just save the the final calculated desired direction. You save that and use that variable every frame. It's just that every X amount of times, every so many frames, you update what that variable is. But right now we're running it every frame. Okay, that's great. So this is now running. So what is this gonna do? Well, we need to know what kind of food we're gonna be chasing. Um, so uh, critter type is really the what we are looking for. Um, and for us, it's going to be, we'll have it default to vegetable which is going to be fine. And that is, let's verify, that should be what the Brussels sprouts are flagged as. Uh, over here in their critter script, yeah, they are flagged as vegetables. So our gnomes are going to be hunting down vegetables. Great stuff. So how are we going to do that? Well, we have in the critters class, I have this um, dictionary of all critters by type. And critters automatically keep themselves in this dictionary and organize themselves, which is great. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do something like for each critter C in, um, uh, and it's important to note that this dictionary is a static. So I can access it um, without an instance of critter. So I just say from the critter class, critters by type, and I'm specifically interested in the vegetable ones. I suppose what we could do is check to make sure it's not empty, right? Uh, or null, rather. If, um, would this return null at any point? No, I guess it won't. Well, it might actually. Okay, I'll put in a little check. If dot contains key um, critter type is equal to false, then we have nothing to eat. So that's if it doesn't contain that key. That key could also point to an empty list, which would be fine. We just wouldn't loop through anything, and then that would work out all right. But we'll just return if that type was never added to the dictionary in the first place. A little bit of a safety feature. Okay, so we're going to loop through all vegetables right now, and then we're going to find the closest one. So let's do something like critter closest, which is going to start off being equal to null. I mean, I don't have to set it, but let's make it explicit so we know what's going on. And um, I guess we should have a distance, which... If you're going to use it in NEF, it does have to be instantiated. Otherwise, the compiler says a thing. So we're going to say it's infinitely far away. So we're going to loop through each critter in this list, and we're going to find the closest vegetable to us. 
because that's what we're interested in moving to. So we will say if if closest is equal to null, or so if we already don't have a closest, that's fine. Otherwise, we do have a closest one. But let's find out. So um, let's make a new distance float d, which is the distance from um, vector three dot distance. This is the distance between um, our transform. Whoops transform.position and the critters transform.position. So we'll know the distance between our two objects. So if closest is not is null, or if this new distance is less than our old distance, then we say, hey, the closest is this critter with a distance equal to D. Great stuff. If we get down here, if closest is equal to null, no valid food targets exist. And then we just return. Boom. Mm -hmm. Whoever dislikes equals false, never consider rebuilding a code. Yeah, saving like three characters, like we could do this. But how easy when you're trying to read this code, when you're trying to read someone else's code, for example, and how easy it is to miss that exclamation mark. Whereas if I say that it's very clear what's going on. You can't miss this fault, especially since it's being highlighted in code. Um, it makes it a lot easier to see explicitly. We are checking for falseness, right? As opposed to trueness. Usually if I'm, if I'm checking for true, often I do just do this because this is fine. And it's kind of what you expect, but with that little knot up there, it's easy to miss much clearer, way better. We have to remember that like, Typing five extra characters or whatever basically costs you nothing. Misreading a line of code, horrific. Um, vector two in line, yeah, we well, could use vector twos, but it's fine. When you're using this dot transform dot position, this is a vector three. Um, and with our 2D game, they're gonna have the same Z axis, but we could instead, and if you would prefer, we could absolutely do this, um, but then we wouldn't wanna use this dot transform dot position. Well, I could, I think it would auto convert. Yeah, I guess it's happy about that. Um, and then it would automatically drop the Z portion, which I guess would be okay. It would be better if for some reason you ended up with your 2D objects on different layers and that would make the math better or not different layers, but like if you'd messed up and put in a number. So I guess that would be better. Um, and if we do it this way, we don't have to bother getting the rect triangle. So, okay, there we go. So it'll automatically ignore the Z portion. Excellent. So again, we are finding the closest critter. Find the closest edible critter to us. So now what we want to do is now we want to move towards this closest edible critter. So what we need to know is we need to know our direction, right? Uh, so let's make this, although I don't really need a placeholder value here, but let's just go for it anyway. What is the direction we want to move in? Well, assume we're at zero, zero. Right? We ourselves are at coordinates 0, 0, and our target is at coordinates 1, 0. What direction do we want to move in when we translate? Well, we're obviously want to move in positive x, which might be mirrored for you guys, I'm not sure, but we want to move in positive x. So when you think about it that way, what we want to do is we want to take our closests dot transform dot position minus our own transform dot position. And you don't need this, but I do, again, for legibility, I like to put that in there and make it explicit which way we're going. This is technically vector three math, but we'll convert it down to a vector two, which is fine. Great, so now we have a direction we want to go in. How do we communicate that back to the critter? Well, we know with the critter, what it's going to do, it's going to call the do AI behavior on all the, the, the scripts, all the components on this object, of which we are one, right? This is do AI behavior. And then after that, it's going to loop through everything in desired direction. So our job here isn't to return anything or anything like that. Instead, it's to say, hey, on our, our own critter, we want to say the desired directions, we want to add a new weighted direction item. And I guess for the sake of clarity, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say weighted direction WD is equal to new weighted direction, and it needs a couple of parameters. And that's what we're going to add to the list. I don't actually need to store any of this in, in temporary variables, but it's fine. So weighted direction requires us to specify a direction and a weight. Well, we know our direction is this. And for our weight, we're just going to put a weight of one. It's going to be a good baseline weight, a value of one. That's the importance 
of hunting this food. Now, it is worth noting that this is actually not strictly direction. This vector is the total distance in x and y between the two. Okay? It's a direction, that, it's a vector that goes directly from one to the other, and it could have a length of whatever. If, if it's very close to each other, this could have a length less than one. Or if it's very far, it could have a length much bigger than one. Weighted direction over here does make sure to normalize this vector. And it's uh, this value is read-only, so um, other than inside of the constructor, you cannot change the value of these two. That way, it does guarantee that our weighted direction's direction is actually a length of one. It's a unit vector, no matter what. Um, alternatively, we would have to do something like wd.direction.normalized times weight. But now we know that it's a true and proper direction over here. Makes it easy. And we don't have to worry about converting it over here. We've, we've covered that already. So... We, we determine what our direction is. We create a new weighted direction. So it's a direction with a weight of one. And we add that to the list of uh, desired directions. Done. Let's find out if this works. I don't know. So in theory here, our gnome has its critter script, also has its AI seek food script. So if I hit play, it should move up to the Brussels sprouts. Once it gets there, it'll probably shimmy back and forth. You can't see my entire screen? Oh! Oh, uh, my bad. Boom. There we go. It was um, set to crop from the last time we played Dwarf Fortress. Hopefully you guys haven't missed too much. My bad. There we go. All right. So if we hit play, the gnome should move up to the Brussels sprout because it should find the closest Brussels sprout and move towards it. Let's see if we've made any... Horrible mistakes. No, it does. And then, like I said, it sort of jitters over here. Because what it's doing, it's overshooting, right? Every frame, it's like moving up towards it. Wow, the frame rate, because I'm only capturing at 30 FPS, it looks really funny on my preview screen. I have no idea what it's going to look like on Twitch. But yeah, he's definitely bouncing back and forth because he keeps sort of overshooting the middle of the Brussels sprout and then overshooting back and back and back and back. And that's okay. So we're going to go and see if we can't improve that a bit. Because... And right now he's not eating. He's moving towards the Brussels sprout. And we can check if I were to take this guy, duplicate it, move it over here. He should move towards this guy. And he does. And then if I move it further away, oops, I may have to be a little faster here. Move it far away. There we go. Now he'll move there. So he's always moving towards the closest Brussels sprout. So that's great. So what is he going to do when he gets there? So we'll put in a little bit of extra logic here. Over here, so we want to move towards the closest edible critter. But what if, if the distance is less than what? Right? Um, say, let's say we have an eating range. So let's say we have some value called eating range. Public float eating range, and we'll set it, I don't know, to one to start off with. If the distance between us and the closest food is less than eating range, we can assume we can start nibbling on this now. So we actually don't have to keep moving. That will eliminate the jitter. There's a few different ways to eliminate the jitter, but this is a good one. If we literally get close enough that we're basically on top, then we can stop. So we only move towards it if we are beyond the eating range. If we're within the eating range, then what are we going to do? Well, what if we... Um, tell you what, let's, um, let's cache our own critter here. Critter. My critter. Like this. My critter is equal to, we get this component. There we go, because we're going to need to do this more than once. And you really, you don't usually want to do get component more than once per frame. In Unity 5, um, those get component requests are, are pretty cached and optimized, but it's still going to be better to do that. So over here, we're going to say, what does it mean to eat? Well, I'd say my critters dot energy is going to increase based on, I guess we're going to take the closest critters health away. So, actually, let's do this. Um, float uh, HP eaten is equal to, say, well, we can't eat more than they've got. So I guess what I'll do is a mathf.clamp, where we would like to eat, I don't know. Well, we should probably have a variable for that. But let's say we want to eat um, five hit points per second. 
and we um we can't eat less than zero but the maximum we can eat is based on the closest critters hit points so we can't eat more than the health that they've got so it'll usually be five but sometimes it'll be a little less than that so we will then eat those hit points Ooh, this should probably be this is five hit points per second i would say so time not delta time there we go five hit points per second so then we will remove that much um this way so we'll remove that much from the target's health and then we're going to gain energy equal to say let's say double we gain twice as much energy as we move in hit points sounds fine we'll try that um we should probably actually um have this as variables so something like public float uh hp per second is equal to five and public float um, eat HP to energy is equal to there. That's our multipliers. So don't want to hard code in some values. So that's the speed and eat HP to energy conversion strength is over here. So now let's see what happens. If we hit play, we should move to the closest sprouts, which I think will be the one to the right and start nibbling. Whoa. Russell Sprouts, you have a health of 100. Eat HP per second, which should be 5 on our gnome. Multiply by time not delta time, which should be a much lower value. So this should be really tiny. So we should be removing a really tiny amount. Oh, I'm subtracting the health. <laughs> there we go. I was, I was subtracting the target's full health every frame instead of the actual amount we were eating. Okay, that should make a lot more sense. There you go. He's noshing. Oh, also the Brussels sprouts are currently losing energy per frame, which is wrong. Um, Brussels sprouts, energy per second. Oh, hang on, critters. Oops. There we go. Brussels sprouts are, aren't supposed to lose energy over time. It makes no sense. So our, our gnome should go over there. And you can see this, he is eating the Brussels sprouts, lowering its health, while his own energy is staying full because he keeps eating and uh, filling himself up. That's great. Now, our badger over here is still starving to death. Poor guy. Look at him, he's about to run out of all the food. And then once he runs out of energy, his health power will start going down. So, how do we get the poor badger to eat so he doesn't starve to death? Well, we've done all the work for that. Our badger here, let's just give him the AI seek food behavior but for the critter type instead of vegetable we are going to say you eat herbivore and we're going to apply this so now just by adding this script to the badger what should happen is our badger should go eat our gnome nom 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 and that is indeed what's happening the gnome is sitting here eating the brussels sprout the badger is eating the gnome everyone is happy okay now the gnome is not particularly happy the brussels sprouts well they live in a life of misery so they're not particularly relevant Who's that? Um, oh, I missed a tip earlier from Ponyu7, who said, time to program Skynet. <laughs> and Dr. Evil, who says, I've been bitching in your Stellaris, Hoi4, and EU4 YouTube content a lot recently. Wanted to say thanks for the great series. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Evil, too. <laughs> All right. So now, it feels like the gnome should probably run away from the badger. If the badger gets too close, the gnome should run away. And this is where the, be the beauty of this sort of, like, behavior system gets put in because normally in in sort of first crack at ai people do hey crash um at this point you would be in your ai code you'd be like ah oh, but you know we figure out the closest thing but uh what if there's a badger nearby um then we do like you know if badger too close do some other things and then and then you add more and more and more with this behavior and you end up with these crazy nested if statements no this ai seek food behavior is going to stay simple like this its only job is to figure out the closest edible food 
and move towards it. So we're going to start with a new AI behavior script. <laughs> AI avoid, I'll call it avoid predator, really like, well, or avoid critter type. Or actually it should be evade critter type, I think. Evade critter type. So we have a new script. I'm going to open this up. Bam. Close this. Hello, respond? No? Or, you know, mono there we go. Um, oh, of course, copy and paste never works because, because mono behavior or mono develop sucks. Evade critter type. There. Uh, Jake Short, hey, thank you very much for the sub. So, in our evade critter type behavior, well, we're going to have this do AI behavior function as well, all right? Because that's, that's what makes it a behavior is it has this function, which gets run every frame. And we're probably gonna want a public string um, critter type to avoid. And by default, I mean, carnivore, things that are avoiding critters are probably looking to avoid car carnivores, so we're gonna do that. So how does this work? Well, it's actually gonna be exactly the same as seek food. We're gonna find the closest one of these and GTFO. So literally the only difference between do AI behavior for seek food and evade critters is instead of moving towards the thing, we're moving away from the thing. Um, and in addition to that, we're not actually eating it. Now, this could be a case where you could have a base, um, you could have an AI seek base class, and then you could have a child version of it, which is AI seek food, which adds the extra thing of I will also you know, consume the food when I get there. And then you could have your evade script also be a descendant of AI seek, but all it does is it inverts the little minus sign. For us, we're gonna just, I'm actually gonna copy this function as is. Anytime you copy and paste, it should be a good sign of, hmm, maybe I could do something a little bit more object oriented. So I'm gonna copy this. It's gonna find something of this critter type. It's gonna find the closest one. Um, if we don't have anything closest, we bail. We are not going to eat it at all. We don't care about that. So we're gonna skip this. All we've gotta do is find out the direction towards this critter. Oh, I guess we need the um, our little mine critter code as well. And we don't need an update function. What we're going to do is we're just going to invert this direction. Which, I mean, this is not literally the most efficient way of doing it, but we just multiply it by negative one. So this is the inverted direction. So instead of moving towards the target, we're moving away from it. We could, you know, just, you know, invert this math. We could do a bunch of different things. But let's just say that. We are running away from this. And for now, we're going to keep the weight at 1. We're going to see what happens when we do this. So if I go and on our gnome, on our gnome, I say evade critter type. And you're evading a carnivore. Great. And I'm going to apply this so that our gnomes have this as part of the prefab. And let's hit play on this. Now our gnome should have a slightly different behavior because he's trying to avoid the badger while also trying to get to the food. So he's trying to do both. Both have exactly the same weight. So right now we end up in this situation where he's trying to do both at the exact same priority. But I suspect running away from the badger is probably more important than running towards food. Don't you think? Um, and for the sake of argument, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the badger a little bit slower. I'm going to drop the badger speed from a 2 to a 3 um, because it'll make it a little easier to see, you know, stuff that's going on here. But in the end, what we're going to end up with... Oh, they're perfectly balanced here. That's kind of funny. If I go and make the badger a little angled, there we go. Now we get the circle stuff again. All right, so the gnome's trying to run away, but the badger is close enough. He keeps taking bites. You can see the gnome's hit points keep going down. And actually, the gnome's energy keeps going down as well because the gnome can't quite get close enough to the Brussels sprouts right now. So instead of having them perfectly even... What if, so we, this evasion, we want to make it more important. So what if we just made the weight 10? Yeah, we dropped from a 3 to a 2, my bad, not the other way around. If we make the weight for evasion a 10, so it's much more important, then the gnome will do this and keep running away. But the gnome is running faster than the, the badger, but will always run away infinitely far no matter what. Because there's no sort of range at which we stop worrying about this badger. Now, there's two things we could do here. Hey, Dunkler Prophet, thank you very much. 
been watching your videos since your first Stellaris video, and I watch your Hobby 4 stuff, and I have to say I love your videos. Greetings from Germany. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, Danke. No. Yes. Right? I know. Bitte. I'll just say that one. Everyone says bitte every three sentences in Germany. Um, so, what could we do here? What we could say, hey, listen. You know, is there a max range that we were about? Like, if distance is greater than 10 units or something like that, we are too far to care about the badger. You know, we could just return instead of doing anything else. That's fine. Let's take a look at what that looks like. Bidas, please, but it's like bidas everything. It's like, thank, like, you go to a restaurant, right? And this is what gets me. You go to a restaurant and um, someone brings you something. And, and they'll say bitte. It's just like, it's just like politeness. It's every three words in Germany. They just throw that in. So if we do this, the gnome will only run away when the badger is within 10 tiles. But then it's still going to be like, we're still making it top right. Here you can see that there's a bit of gnome jitter because like every other frame, it's not far enough. What happens if there's more than one badger and how do you work that out? Well, and who do you run away from the most? Well, like right now we're just running away from the closest one, that's fine. What if we do something a little bit different? What if RJ Max got it? What if we do, what if we change the weight based on how far away from the badger we are? If the badger's right on top of us, then the most important thing is to get out of there. But if the badger's not right on top of us, maybe we can just sort of like move away a little bit while also maybe going towards a, a Brussels sprout so we can take a nibble of Brussels sprout before then we have to boot it and get out again. And that's the inverse square is like, oh, so great. So the idea is this, the weight is going to scale based on, yeah, did I just hear a Canadian making fun of German politeness? It's true though. If we're gonna scale the weight based on the distance between us and the badger. So let's imagine, let's imagine this situation, okay? If the badger is right on top of us, we'd like a weight of, I don't know, a hundred, something ridiculous, okay? Because it'll just dwarf everything else. But as it moves further away, we want that value to drip, to drip down. So let's say, Let's say if it's so if it's within let's say on top of us is anything within like one unit, right? So if they're within one unit, we want a weight of hundred. If they're like two units away, then maybe it can be half as important. You know, fifty. All right? Okay, so distance divided by two, you're like, oh that's pretty good. But then once you're ten units away, then you'd be doing hundred divided by ten, it would still have a weight of ten, which we've determined is probably overwhelming and too much. So the inverse square means that you take the square of the distance and you use that as the divisor. So as you fall further and further away, the weight drops and drops and drops. So if we're taking the square of the distance, in this case, let's say the distance is now 10, so you square, that's now 100. So 100 divided by 100, now the weight is one if you're 10 units away. And that's not so bad. So that's what we're going to do. So our weight is going to be equal to, let, we're going to assume it's got a base avoidance rating of 100 and it's going to be divided based on the um i guess it's power well you know what to save a power function we can just say something like distance times distance like that and that's our weight so it'll drop off exponentially faster as we move further away i suspect this weight might still be a little too much and you might want to still set a, a, a base um distance yes i know just reverse the vectors but i'm trying to make this explicit Again, this is a tutorial going for maximum clarity, so I'm trying to keep the code identical to the previous version and making an explicit negative here. Yes, it would be more efficient to just flip these two things around, which I already mentioned earlier. So I think I got that right. Let's find out. Math is hard. Do, 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 do. So let's, uh, let's add some more, um, some more Brussels sprouts for us to look for as well. As we're running away from the badger, Let's see what happens here. So we hit play. See this, it's curving towards the Brussels sprout because it's like, oh, maybe I could have gotten there. I think that the, the weight of the badger avoidance is too high. Let's make it a base weight of like 100. All right, sorry, 10, not 100. There you go. So now he's like, oh, I really want this Brussels sprout. Run it. Okay, now I gotta go away. And now with this one here, oh, now go away. So he's taking a little bit of a nibble. 
Just a tiny little bit of a nibble going on over there. And he curves around here, curves around the badger. He's going to try to go for another sprout. Now, one thing that's happening here is he's trying to move towards the closest Brussels sprout. But it actually, in this case, what's interesting is it would be more optimal if instead of moving towards the closest Brussels sprout, he was actually moving towards a sprout that was further away from the predator. And then you've got different ways of mixing this in. So we change, now when we're looking for food, our heuristic for determining the best food, right, over here. Right now, we are determining the best food for us to move towards simply based on our distance from the food. But what if we changed it to be a combination of the distance from the food? So food that is closer to us scores higher, but food that is furthest away from a predator also scores higher. So then you end up in this middle ground where something that's relatively close while being far from a predator is our top priority. And that could be very evident if we change this around. Let's move the badger over here and let's move a Brussels sprout right over there. And let's put this one up over here. So this is the closest set of sprouts. So right now, he will go towards the sprout until the weight of the badger becomes overwhelming, at which point he'll start running away. It looks like because of the, the math of the movement, um, he's actually never eating here. So I'm going to give the, um, the gnome just a little bit higher eating range. I mean, there's other ways to balance it, but let's do something like that. Let's make him eat a little further away and see if that uh, helps him out. Yeah, he's taking a little bit of a nibble and then he moves away. This jerkiness can be smoothed out in a variety of different ways as well. Um, one of the best ways to do it might be if our critter saves its previous direction from last frame, and instead of setting to a new direction instantly, actually takes the average of the two, or does a lerp from frame to frame. So let's, add, let's see if we can add that in as a final thing. Instead of going to the closest, we're going to do a score. So we're going to have a score. This distance instead is going to be um, score. Or, you know what, we'll, we'll keep calling it distance. But we'll add distance to things that are closer to a predator than anything else. Although this would require a second loop inside. And <laughs> How do we want to do this? What are we happy about? Uh, you could use acceleration, that is absolutely true. That might end up being better. That might feel more comfortable. I'm not sure. And at this point, we get into the, uh, the zone of like, what are we comfortable with? I mean, in a sense, the desired direction can, yeah, definitely be treated as an acceleration. So what if we do that? What if we keep on our critter? That, that would probably look a lot better. On our critter, let's have a vector 2, which is our velocity. Um... our velocity and our velocity each frame we're gonna we're gonna do like um a math or a vector two dot lerp between our current velocity and our desired velocity which is here and it's just going to be based on time to delta time something like times 10. If you do something like this, you'll get a really nice smooth move from one to the other. Actually, let's just take the delta time as is and see how that works. And then we'll do this. So every frame, we sort of blend between our desired direction and our current one, which is going to start at zero. So it's going to build up and move there. So we'll slowly change over time. This should actually look pretty good. Let's see what happens. Oh, can't decide, can't decide. Oh, I got to get away from this thing. He did take a nibble along the way. Now he's going to come around. He's going to grab some more bites of the Brussels sprouts as he goes by, refill his energy a bit, and then... Oh, no, no, you got to keep running away. Keep running away. Keep going. We might want to uh, we might want to have him change directions a little faster. So let's say we just multiply this by, I don't know, five. So now he's going to be a little bit more responsive, but you still get a lot of that little blending, which is going to look nice. And then you can keep piling on more and more and more of these. Uh, what time is it? We might have time for hiding. There you go. He's going to outlast the badger. The gnome is smarter than the badger. 
He's got a little bit of energy left because he's able to swing by from time to time. I mean, I guess the gnome is also moving a lot faster as part of it. But between the speed and being able to occasionally nimble on something, this orbit is kind of funny. That's happened right here. <laughs> At some point, the badger is going to die. And the gnome will have a little bit of energy left. And then he's just going to go and eat. Nom, 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 nom. There we go. Oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good, actually. Mm, I'm sure we have a way to slow down acceleration. Um, if you're going with acceleration, send more models. Well, um, the if none of the if none of the um, the behaviors return anything, the vector will be zero, so it will slowly move towards zero, um, and that will be okay. So then you add extra levels of intelligence as well, right? With the evasion, right now we just move directly away from the target. But what if there's another way to avoid it, right? What if you figure out not necessarily where this badger is right now, but maybe take into account where it's moving to. Maybe it's chasing someone else. Maybe the badger has a really bad turning radius. Um, let's let's try to include hiding. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to like pull it off properly in time, but let's give it a try. So what we're going to do is I need a new sort of dummy image here. Let me create a sprite circle. And this is going to be a hedge. Badger, or gnomes can hide in hedges, is what happens. And we are going to create a empty. And below that empty, I'm going to give it the hedge graphic. There we go. And we're going to color that green. Like this. So this is a hedge. <laughs> like this. And because so, what we're doing, what we're doing here is we're going to add a third behavior to our gnome. Uh, this should be centered within there. Thank you very much. And we're going to drop the hedge, say, over here. And let me add a component here called hedge. And it's not going to do anything by itself. Um, it's going to have, let's say, I'm going to have a program radius in here so that I can actually radius equals um, say three. So we're going to go with uh, transform dot get child uh, zeroth child dot local scale is equal to um, vector three dot one slash radius. So if I just change this in code, it'll scale the, the thing visually correctly. If I hit play, there we go. So now we know what radius this thing will be. Uh, let me move it over here. So the idea is um, to hide. So we're going to add a new behavior. So the gnome is going to still have its behavior to just run away from the, um, from the badger. But we're going to add a new behavior in here. Doo -doo -doo. AI hides in hedges or hides from predator. And this is going to do the following. We're going to grab. Come on, Mono. You can do it. There we go. Just going to grab this setup over here. Actually, in the critter types as well. So we're just going to see if there's any predator within X distance from us and we're within Y distance from a hedge, then we will try to run into the hedge. That's what we're going to try to do. So let me grab this first for this evade. It's going to be a little bit different. We actually don't care about the closest per se. All we're going to do is say bool um, predator nearby, which sets to false. So we don't care about the closest or distance or anything like that. We just loop through. And so we're going to have a public float um, fear distance. So if anything's within five. Uh, we're going to start looking for a hedge. So, if the distance between us and the predator, if D is less than our fear distance, then we set predator nearby is equal to true. And then we just break out of the loop. We don't care how many, we don't care how close. It's just if there's one within five, then we will go and hide in the hedges. And that's it. And then we say if predator nearby is equal to false, Nothing to fear. Boom. Now, we want to move towards the closest hedge. 
So now we've got to find a hedge. So how do we do that? Well, it's actually, we're going to use this thing, uh, which isn't necessarily the fastest. Um, I guess I could make the hedge a critter. Sure, that's fine. Just like a Brussels sprout. So we will add the... Hmm. What do I want? I mean, we're already finding stuff with the critters. And that might be better. The hedges are different, though. They don't have hit points. No, it's just it's just terrain things. So that's fine. So we can go game object dot um, find no type find objects of type hedge. So this will return an array of hedges like that. It's not super fast. You don't usually want to do this every frame, but let's just you know pretend. Um, and so then we have hedge closest, and we have float dist, which sets to mathf.infinity, just so that we've got something. It really doesn't matter what this value is, because we're not going to compare dist otherwise, but otherwise we do get a complaint. So again, we'll do the same thing for each hedge h in hedges, whoops, hedges, if closest is equal to null, or, um, oh, it's the same thing, uh, vector 2 d is equal to vector 2 dot distance between uh, this dot transform dot position and the uh, h dot transform dot position or d is less than distance then closest is equal to um, h and dist is equal to d if closest is equal to null then we have no hedge to hide no hedges so we just return. Otherwise, we move towards that. So we've got the closest position. We move towards it. We're not running away from it, so I can get rid of that. And the weight, we're just going to force this weight to 100. It's very, very, very important. Very, very, very important. So we're still just sort of going to generally move away from there, but that's okay. And then what I'm going to do is add a new little check in here. Something like... Um, I'm going to just put a little boolean called is in hedge, which is normally false. And we're going to have this um, on trigger enter that says if other dot get component hedge not equals null. If we are colliding with something that has a hedge component, then we set is in hedge equal to true. Just something that we keep track of. Not everything cares, but now triggers know if they're in a hedge. And is it on trigger exit? Ah, I don't remember. I can never remember if it's leave or exit. Because it, these things matter depending on on exit. Um, different APIs for different things, say leave versus exit. So um, there we go. Boop, boop, boop. This won't work unless, and actually, we're going to remove this hedge auto scaling and this radius. We don't need this. I'm going to get rid of that. Um, -da -da -da. So instead, hedge, we are going to have a, uh, a, I think, a circle collider, 2D, which is a trigger. And I'm just going to scale this up 3 by 3. No, 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 Oops. Should be a float. Is in hedges assigned a value but never used? Yeah, that's okay. We're just going to make sure the gnome actually runs into the hedge. So he's going to run away from the, uh, the guy, and then as soon as he gets too close... Oh, that's interesting. We're getting a little bit of conflict there. I wasn't expecting that. Because he should, as a priority, and then he keeps running. Right, because if he's in a hedge, we don't have to evade anymore. Right, so if we are in a hedge, we're going to change a few things. If um, my critter dot is in hedge, oh, it's not public. Let's 
go ahead and just make it public. That's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. If we are in a hedge, we are hidden, so we don't have to evade anything. We just return. Okay. Then, when we're looking for food, we have to ignore if c dot is in hedge. Uh, this possible target is hidden, so we can't chase it. So we just break out of this, or not break, we just continue to the next iteration. So now anything that's in a hedge should be avoided. So once the gnome gets in the hedge, the badger should stop chasing it. I think what's happening here, yeah, I think, let's take a look. Uh, and we can see is in hedge over here. Is it toggling back and forth? Is it never actually triggering? Oh no, it's blinking back and forth here. Because he keeps leaving the, the 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 hedge. Why does he keep leaving the hedge? Because this weight should be huge. It should definitely be pushing in no matter what. As long as there's a predator within... Within the fear distance. Oh! We don't actually have the hides from predator script on here. <laughs> um, our gnome. Hides from predator. Huh? Boom. There we go. <laughs> he he did accidentally go into the hedge on his running away, but at no point was he actually looking to run into it. So let's try that again. So as soon as the predator comes close, the gnome should run inside the hedge and stay there. And then the predator stops because the gnome is hidden. And then if the badger had some sort of wander, right now he can't find anything. So if he wanders away, the gnome pops out again. And then the badger comes back and the gnome hides. And the badger moves away. And the gnome comes out to eat. <gasps> and then he hides again. Now we have a game of hide-and-go-seek. Let's make another copy of this hedge. Let's make a prefab out of this guy. And boop, we'll put another one over here. And maybe I'll take this one and move it down over that way and see how that influences our actions. Oh, gotta go and hide. Okay, we need a wander script. We absolutely positively need a, uh, a wander behavior. Uh, to make the final coolness. We are at 1 p.m., which is when I was supposed to stop, but we're definitely going to add a new type of AI. So let's add a component. Uh, AI wanders like that. And um, my critter does this. And all it's going to do, remove this, it's going to create a weighted move at the end. Uh, what's it called? Do AI behavior. Um, I guess, um, how are we going to mix it up to be interesting? I think I should use like from deer, uh, vector to, to deer, and then we can randomize it up. Yeah, that seems okay. The big thing is this is going to have a super low weight. M very minimal priority. Almost never going to come up unless it's the only thing, which is the sort of thing we would want to add in our weighted direction. This would be good as like a fallback behavior, but I'm going to make it a fallback behavior by giving it a microscopic little weight. And so let me just set both of these for reasons to um, random dot on unit sphere. Yeah. Is that a function? No. Um, ignore the rest of this. I, I had something in mind, but I'm going to be trying to rush it. So it's just going to be set to this random direction for now. So the, the, we're not going to randomize the wander. The, the badger will always wander away in the same sort of random direction. So the badger has that behavior. It's really low priority behavior. 
but it will add a tiny bit of randomness to his move. So when he's got nothing to do, he should move away in a random direction. That's his random wander direction right now. And as soon as he's far enough away, the gnome will pop out to the food, and the badger's like, wait, 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 wait. And then, oh, that was a mistake, Mr. Gnome. We're going to have to wait the uh, the direction that the gnome runs in for the hedge. Um, I guess the waiting is too high because he wasn't avoiding enough. So our uh, hides from predators, instead of doing it at 100, we'll do it at 10. That's probably much better because you should never run through a badger on the way to the hedge. That seems like a fatal mistake. But all of a sudden, doesn't it feel like our stuff's alive? He's going to pop out again. Nom, 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 nom. Yeah, the eating behavior is a little bit wonked with the weights. And he comes out again. <laughs> I love the hide and seek kind of thing going on. And this will work just fine, assuming I have applied all these. If we go and take, um, say, oops, grab the gnome, multiple gnomes. in the sprout patch and multiple badgers oops i think i've got two in place here yeah multiple badgers like this and we hit go oh i think i accidentally made an infinite loop or something oh something's slowing things down We'll have to we'll have to debug that. <laughs> Maybe the badger should patrol the sprouts. That's an interesting idea, actually. Um, as yeah, secondary behavior. All right, so I've got I've got some sort of bad loop somewhere. It's possible, and I'd have to check this. It's possible that one of my four eaches, um, somewhere internally, something might um, be changing some loop inside. Um, it shouldn't be the death over here with the destroy. Oh no, that's right. One of the things I want to do is I want to make sure that. Um, if C dot health is, um, less than or equal to zero, um, this is already dead. Ignore it. So we can just continue. Same thing here, because there are timing things where something might be in the list, but has already, you know, sort of been eliminated. Um, same thing here. Oh, we don't have a C. Hold on. It's not there. It's over here. here so we ignore anyone that's already dead or anything like that but that is going to bring us to the end of the program tutorial we've got something that looks kind of cool um those sorts of like the differences between the weights and the specifics about how we hunt for particular food can all be tweaked like crazy um and we've got something that feels alive i love seeing the gnomes hide in the hedges i think that's freaking fantastic i think it just it feels right and so this kind of structure is very common again it can apply to it can apply to 2d platformers first-person shooters, all kinds of things in between. Um, you can add a little bit more complexity to the weighted direction class that has data that gets passed back and forth so that you can give it more hints about how the behaviors are supposed to interact. Um, the other thing you can do, and this starts to get more involved, and I do recommend that book again. This one here, this is like really helped me out like years ago. I can't remember when this came out. I mean, this is the second edition. Um... It's from 2009, but it's still super duper relevant. Um, it, it talks about ways like group behavior. So you have like sort of behavior chunks, uh, especially, uh, and it does deal with, um, with things like state machines and things as well. But like, you might care about other behaviors. There might be a certain order that you want to process the behaviors in um, because later behaviors might check to see if another one did something, you know, um, different things like that. But that is going to be the end of this tutorial. Hopefully, it's a nice start for you guys who want to do AI. I mean, we ended up with AI that is kind of interesting and combines multiple behaviors in an hour. It's not that hard. The, the tweaking to make it, like, really primo is, is where you will spend your time, you know? But it's, it's that. It's tweaks. It's just changing some of the ways, like, with the evade, like, oh, do we want to change the math on the base weighting? Different things like that, you know? Do we want to have more cutouts for distance and things? Um, do you want to change how we blend the velocities together? All kinds of different things like that. And then you end up with something that's behavior that works better for the particular game you're trying to, <clears throat> you're trying to make. So, 
Uh, that is that. We're going to take a short two-minute break, and when we come back, we're going to be playing some Hearts of Iron 4 as Japan. Uh, and yes, this will be available on my website to download if you want the code, and I'll be hopefully getting up on the YouTube relatively soon. And again, apparently last time I did one of these, I may not have gotten the videos up on YouTube, so I will check into that um, probably after the stream. So, two-minute break. We're going to be back with Hearts of Iron 4, continuing our run as Japan. Thank you everyone who pledged on Patreon to support these videos back in May and are therefore keeping this series going uh, from June through to early July. And a special thank to these mic check level supporters. We got Speedy Savant, Valiant Cake Fiend, Aaron Toibson, Marius Field Vold, Jan Torre Vell, uh, Julian Auger Lafont, Steven Steger, Michael McClintock, Kale the Quick, Drazion, Adjective, Jason Yanity, Wes Oldenboving. Craig Mortel, Neil Blakely, Milner, and absolutely everyone who watched, shared, favorited, and subscribed these videos. Thank you very much for keeping this series going, and I'll see you next time.